Bloomfield, thanks for coming out today. Uh, thanks for everybody in the room. Thanks for everybody that's joining us online as well. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm Sidney Williams, and I'm the course director for Horror, Mystery, and Suspense in the Full Sail BFA Creative Writing Program. It's a mouthful, right? <laughs> um, I am hosting this session called Success in Horror, and I'm pleased to have these gentlemen with me today. Uh, let's uh, welcome them, uh, hold the applause, let's, uh, let me announce them and then uh, we'll welcome them. Uh, we have Darren Lynn Bousman, uh, who is a screenwriter, director, and a 2011 Full Sail Hall of Fame inductee. Oh, clap, come on. <laughs> We have Hunter M. Vai, uh, who is a supervising film editor. He uh, has worked on a lot of shows, uh, including a little cable show some of you may have heard of called The Walking Dead. Uh, he, he is, uh, let me note, a, a 2014 Hall of Fame inductee. And uh, also, we have an actor on the panel with us. Uh, some of you may recognize him or, um, or, or maybe will remind you, he is, uh, he's been in Saw 3, uh, The Barons, and he <laughs> is the long-haired fiend from Insidious. <coughs> so, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Mr. J. LaRose. Uh, let's think and remember to be grateful to these guys for joining us today and taking their time. Um, I can't think of a better way to um, begin talking about success in horror than just letting each of these gentlemen tell us about their success, because horror is kind of interwoven with their careers. And uh, I'd like to kind of go one by one, uh, let you tell us kind of your start. Uh, I know you've worked collaboratively on some things and um, just kind of your career path in horror. And we'll start with Darren. Uh, I mean, it's kind of ironic that I'm on the success and horror panel because I was hoping to sit and learn something because I'm not sure I've actually have found complete success. Um, it's crazy. I mean, it's, um, you know, I went to Full Sail and it's graduated 15 years ago. And uh, Hunter, myself, Jay, were all friends during that, during that Full Sail experience. We made numerous movies together, um, really terrible movies um, <laughs> together. And... Uh, then we went to Los Angeles, uh, Hunter and I went to Los Angeles, and a few years later, um, we kind of found our way. Um, I sold a script called The Desperate, which became Saw 2, uh, and Saw 2 led to Saw 3, and Saw 3 on, and I've been lucky enough to continue to work since then. Um, it's kind of a, a, I could spend an entire day on, on stories, but that's the, the kind of uh, broad strokes of it. Great, great. And Hunter? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that was kind of the fun thing is that the three of us have known each other for so long, and now we get to sit on a panel together, which is kind of yeah, neat. Yeah, baby. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I kind of stumbled into the, I, I call it violence and mayhem stuff. Um, when I was on The Shield, it was the first job that I did, and there was a lot of violence on that, and then people kind of thought, oh, that guy can, can do, you know, people hurting each other. Um, and I kind of found that I really enjoyed <laughs> working with that type of material, and I'd always been a fan of horror. Um, and I don't know, I think what drew me to it was I moved around a lot as a kid and I didn't always have, like my parents got me a TV to like apologize for always being in different places and I would stay up late and watch B movies and I still have a great appreciation for B movies and um, I've really grown into uh, enjoying good horror and Darren and I have actually had a chance to work on three horror movies together, um, one of them The Barons with Jay as well. Well, let's not forget Mother's Day. He had a oh, violent yeah, Mother's he, Day. The first yeah, yeah, death yeah. in Mother's Day. Yeah, 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 I sneak yeah, my yeah. way into most yeah. of Darren's projects. So. Well, yeah. it, was a good it was a good death in Mother's Day. Well, well Jake, tell us <laughs> tell us about your work. Um, you're in a lot of lot of lot of movies. Period. But. Well, yeah, you know, you know, we're, as an actor, you're always looking for more, and you you know, it's between jobs. But I was lucky enough. We met, or I met uh, these guys back when they were here. I was auditioning for a, a little. Uh, a uh, wonderful film called Butterfly Dreams, which you cannot get because it's so rare. You guys have uh, seen Citizen Kane? Yeah. It's the Citizen Kane of short films. <laughs> Keeps everything in balance. Uh, and, and yeah, so we, they cast me and then we became, you know, great friends. And I was lucky enough to 
to uh, be friends with people that I knew were destined for great things. And and Darren, you know, like he said, got the Saw film and and was able to bring me in on the second one. That, you know, I saw three, and for me that was. You know, that just opened up doors, and it's all about networking things, and that just introduced me to the horror genre. I wasn't necessarily a huge horror, you know, aficionado or anything. It just happened to be that's what, you know, this type of movie was. But it was, it was such a blessing because it's, um, I've met so many great people, and, and I met James Wan because of that eventually, and that's how I got my Insidious gig. And uh, so it was just, you know, kind of one of those lucky things for me. And, um, and again, we've just... It's, it's nice to be able to do things with people you know and trust. And, uh, you know, when you get all chained up like that, you, you got to have a little bit of trust in, <laughs> in what's going to happen next. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I was there, so yeah. One thing I'll, I'll say, and I kind of go back on what I was saying before about not knowing success. I think success is a dangerous word. And I, I think that, um, specifically coming back to Full Sail, I'm not a success, I'm a failure. I'm a, I'm a huge failure, but you guys know about the 1% success. What you don't hear about is the 99% failure. For every one movie that I've directed, there's 19 or 20 that I was fired from, let go, or never got made. And part of being successful is knowing that you can fail and it's okay to fail. And in fact, embrace failure because with failure comes success. If all you knew is success, I mean, that's a, that's a boring place to be. What makes it cool is the fact that it's like a roller coaster. If you were just going down on a roller coaster, it's not fun. It's, it's the going up and then going down and then going sideways. And, then, and that's what I think success is. It's, it's knowing that you're going to fall and being okay with falling. And so when you say like success and horror, Success, yeah, saw two and three, so four, that's success. 11, 11, not success. The 12 movies that, that never got off the ground, not success. But then you see a Mother's Day, that's a success. So I think that just one thing to, to, to point out before we start the panel is it's okay to fail. And being on a successful panel, I failed a lot. So embrace the failure with the success. I just wanted to say that before we start off. Good point. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned, you know, success and, and, and downturns and things. Uh, what are some things that uh, creators working on horror projects, either on spec scripts or short films or, or independent films, what are some things they should keep in mind uh, in crafting horror? Any thoughts, pointers? Uh, the thing why I love horror so much is there's so many different subgenres of horror. There's um, religious horror, there's gore horror, there's psychological horror, there's zombie. There's so many different types. I mean, for me, um, what I love about it, and I think it's, it's the most important thing, is you should be able to remove horror from the movie, and the movies still work. So if you're doing a movie about a monster, if you remove the monster, will the story still work? If you're doing a movie about zombies, if you remove the zombies, will the story still work? And in the case of Saul, if you remove the traps, the torture, will the story still work? So for me, I always look at what's the story, and then I take away the horror from it, I take away the scares, I take away whatever, and does the story still work? That, to me, is how I look at any horror movie. Well, I think the good horror movies are the ones that <clears throat> explore the human condition, where you get to learn more about you know, the characters and what they're actually going through. I mean, that's what I think worked about The Walking Dead, is that it's first and foremost a group of story, a story about a group of people that are trying to survive. There happen to be zombies that are there, that, you know, and that's so what makes it cool and fun. And, <clears throat> gory and so well, so character very important I think you, you know, have to have that first yeah. for for the barons I, I think I do I, the barons to me which if you guys haven't seen it it's, it's a movie about a, a guy who goes into the woods and it's about the legend of the Jersey Devil and it, w that was the first thing I said let's remove the Jersey Devil from the movie completely and it's a man's descent into madness there happened to be a monster in the movie but it was about a descent into madness. That, that was my note. I know. <laughs> you just stole my note. I know. I'm going to take credit for it. <laughs> um, but I called you and said, you need to take the monster out of the movie. I know. What are you going to do? Why are you stealing that from me as I'm sitting next to you? <laughs> uh, can someone have Hunter removed from the panel, please? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you also haven't seen uh, The Barons, Jay LaRose has one of the greatest, the greatest moments of cinema history where the monster is coming at everyone and Jay takes off running away He's like, oh. it was like, it and was I like asked you to take that out of the movie, and, uh, yeah. and uh, that didn't happen. Hey, Let's just say Jay was not a heroic the, character. You went He's back locked and loaded in the deleted scene, though, isn't yeah. he? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's right. <laughs> well, with you know that in mind, uh, how important is it to know what has come before and know classic horror, know the TV shows, the movies that have come down the pipe? 
I would say the majority of my day is is learning and watching uh, other films. And I mean, I have go-to films that I watch before I do any movie. I'll watch The Shining. I'll watch Rosemary's Baby. I'll watch Clockwork Orange. Um, these type of movies that inspire and I think evoke a feeling. Uh, and, and the thing I think is so great about those movies is they they're they're you know 30 years old and they still have the same impact every time I watch them again. You know, you see a lot of these single-serving films that come out, and they're, they're fun to watch once, but I'll never revisit them again. Um, and so what I try to do is study the movies that I do watch over and over. Like, I'll watch Alien or Aliens over and over and over again, and I try to pick it apart about why do I like it so much? Why am I continuing to watch it over again? And I think I learn new things each time I watch The Shining. Every time I watch that movie, I, I learn new things about it. So for me... It, it's absolutely important. It's, it's as important as reading a textbook. Watch what you're trying to emulate. Watch what you're trying to strive to be. Cool. I mean, we're all, it's all a big language that we've created, that's been created over years. And it's one of the things that when I did the Walking Dead pilot, <clears throat> When I read it, I didn't really understand until the footage started to come in that it's like one man's journey, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, starts off as like a, you know, cop chase, and then it turns into uh, like the Twilight Zone, and then there's elements of Stanley Kubrick in there, and then there's, it turns into a Western with a man on a horse riding into a city, and there's, it was, and then like at the very end, it becomes like full on like Romero zombies eating a dead horse and ripping it apart, and man going into a tank, it's just completely crazy. Um, and it's all having that knowledge and of the films that have come before and building upon that and, you know, tipping your hat to it, but also making something that's new and yours. Well, and, um, and it, the, you won an Ace Eddie Award for the pilot for The Walking Dead. I did. And, uh, you noted, I, I believe in one interview that, uh, just when the material was put before you, you, you saw that they had a lot of respect for the audience uh, in oh, the yeah. material. And uh, talk about the things you saw that you were excited by when you got When that footage was coming in, I was petrified because uh, it, it, was, it was for me to, to mess it up because it was just, it was beautifully shot. Um, and uh, there's very little dialogue, so you don't have a whole lot to go on to inform the audience of what's happening. You're exploring this new world through the character as he's, you know, seeing what's happening. Um, and you know, like, I mean, like I'd hinted on, you know, like there's so many different styles going on within that movie, like or within that episode. You really needed to have the talent of, you know, Frank Darabont helming that. And he's somebody that just watches movies all the time. And he just has this database to lean back onto, to, to dig into that, uh, um, I mean, I really enjoy working with him and telling that story and not always having music lead the audience, not always having that kind of stuff, like allowing the audience to figure it out for themselves. And Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you guys have, have worked on a lot of... Uh, it, uh, the Barons, I thought, was a great movie, by the way, great monster movie. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, projects together and, and apart. You just laugh when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> You're an asshole. <laughs> well, I was laughing. You said it's a good monster movie, and my note was take the monster out of the movie. <laughs> well, so I was laughing. Oh, and I, I did think it was great. I mean, you know, you found a great way to use the Jersey Devil. We don't know. We don't know if it's Stephen Moyer's imagination. We right, don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, but but you guys have have done interesting things. You haven't always stayed safe. You mentioned, of course, it's a roller coaster. Maybe that's successful and maybe that's not. But uh, can you share some thoughts on choosing projects and risky versus safe and maybe <coughs> boiling it down to art versus commercial? Uh, when do you when do you take a risk? When do you put the toe out there? My career, I think, was headed on a trajectory of I did three number one movies back to back to back, and I basically could have done anything at that point. And they said, you can do anything at this point. And the safe bet would have been doing Saw 5. Um, I would have had four number one movies, theoretically, back to back. Um, but to me, that wasn't why I got into filmmaking. I didn't get into filmmaking to, it wasn't about money, it wasn't about the glitz and glamour, it was about creating art. I'm an artist, and I wanted to do something that inspired me. And I think that for me, the Saw movies became stale. It became a, it became a machine. Uh, anyone could have directed at that point. They had, the, they had the, the same cinematographer, they had the same editor, they had the same cast. And it, I became lazy as a filmmaker. When I made Saw 4, I was lazy. I, uh, I wasn't inspired. I stopped being inspired. 
and it became a job to me. And I said, I have to, I have to wake up. I have to do something new. And so the furthest thing away from doing a torture porn or whatever you want to call them horror film was working with Paris Hilton and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, making a rock opera. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, for me, Repo the Genetic Opera is the most um, inspirational film that I've done because it was so different and so unique and, and everyone was telling me not to make it. And that's exactly why I had to make it. I had to do something different. Now, in some respects, that's what pushed me off the mantle and, and led me into the down part of the roller coaster that I'm still not completely recovered from. Um, Repo was the biggest commercial failure. I mean, Ben Lyons of At The Movies called it not only the worst movie of the year, but the worst movie of all time. And, uh, you know, I lost every movie that I had at that time. I was attached to four or five movies. I had like a Mila Jovovich film I was fired from. I had all these movies that just started firing me after Repo came out. But I never felt more fulfilled in my life because um, I did something that no one else could have done or no one else would have done at that time. I made something that inspired me. I made something that I consider to be artistic and something that was new and original. And I kind of try to stay with that for the rest of, you know, as long as I'm able to make movies. And, you know, that could end at any time. But right after Repo, I wanted to do a crime thriller. And then I wanted to do another weird musical. So for me, it's about... It's an art, and the, the, but the thing is, and the reality is, is this, I dug my own grave because it's called the movie business for a reason. It's about business. Um, no one's gonna keep giving me money to throw it away and make weird, you know, weird artistic stuff. So you've gotta find the balance about what is art and what actually makes money. And you see something, you see something like Birdman. Birdman was so artistic and ballsy and weird and unique. And it got the accolade. So I think it's finding that, that uh, balance of something that, that will be a commercial success, yet still maintains your artistic integrity. Um, and I think lastly, what I've kind of found in, in my career is, is the, you gotta, do, you gotta do a couple for them before you can do one for you. So like, I've got a couple of, of films that I'm really excited about that are commercial movies. Abattoir is very commercial. It's a haunted house movie. Um, that uh, that I'm doing. It'll be the next movie that comes out. Then right after that, I have Devil's Carnival 2. So I'm doing a, a, a studio film, and then I'm doing a weird rock opera again. So I think that that's how I'm balanced, balanced it out for myself, is, is that I can still have my weird arty things, but I have to realize it's a business, and I have to be able to show them that I can make money by doing something that's a little more commercial. Cool. Um, then to just follow up with some of those films you mentioned, uh, did you have a love of musicals too before you started doing those? Hunter, why don't we talk about what happened when I drove from Full Sail to Los Angeles the first time? <laughs> we had walkie-talkies in three different cars, and we all had, and Darren would just sing show tunes the entire drive, cross country. On the walkie-talkies, and the well, and then we would we were editing, and he would he would. We were, we're editing all these different projects we would do, and he was watching Jesus Christ Superstar singing, Hunter, 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 watch this, watch this, watch this. Um, <laughs> one of the things which is kind of awesome for me and the, and the thing that I consider true, this is what I consider success. And, and it's, not, it's not having a number one movie, but it's accomplishing a goal. And those goals could be anything. They can be small, they can big, be big. You set your own goals, and you determine what your own success is. But for me, my all-time favorite movie, all-time favorite movie is Jesus Christ Superstar. My second all-time favorite movie is Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, and so when I did Devil's Carnival 2, I made two phone calls. I called Ted Neely, who played Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar, and I said, I want you to be in Devil's Carnival 2. Ted Neely, the guy who I watched all throughout uh, middle school and high school and full sale, is the lead of Devil's Carnival 2. And Barry Bostwick from Rocky Horror is the, what, the second lead of Devil's Carnival. And I got Adam Pascal from Rent. So I, I basically went down a list of all of these people that I respected, I admired, I looked up to, and I called them all. So me getting Ted Neely is cooler than getting Tom Cruise because I am a huge Ted Neely fan. Now, Tom Cruise is a great actor, but for me, it, I cared about wanting to work with people I idolized, and I've been able to constantly work with people I idolize, hence why Jayla Rose is in every movie. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, that, that, uh, that brings up a question I was going to ask anyway, but I, you, you mentioned some great guys you've gotten to work with, and uh, everybody's had kind of that experience. Jay, who are some cool people you got to work with? Jay, think very carefully before you answer that question. Well, Darren, of course, is, Thank you. is um, the most amazing. I'm pretty sure Hunter's going to be directing something soon, so he's right up there. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I started kind of late in my 
life uh, doing this, so I have a lot of catching up to do and a lot of learning, and every time I get on set, it's a learning experience. So there, every set I've been on, everybody I've gotten to work with actors, you know, like Shawnee Smith and Saw and Tobin Bell, um, you know, I just hang out, I loiter on set and watch these guys, and I've never had, you know, bad experiences with any of them. It's just amazing to me to watch their process and how they work, and how other directors work, of course. You know, Darren and I have a very special relationship, so I'm very comfortable and, you know, uh, I'm very relaxed, but when I get on a new set where it's, he's not the director, and then it, it, the nerves start to kick in, all right, how do I, uh, you know, you, you want to be the best you can be, so you work again, because work begets more work typically. Um, and lucky for me, I, I've never had anybody, you know, tear me a new asshole or anything, you know, for something I did, or even witnessing that. It's been, I've been pretty lucky in that everybody I've worked with, I've tended to get along with really well, because I think I'm kind of an easy laid back kind of guy, and that, that I think helps, but, but it's, uh, I haven't had any problems, and everything's been just wonderful and, and a learning experience. Uh, Moyer, Moyer, Stephen Moyer was, you know, awesome to watch. We did uh, um, Erica Christensen. She, she, yeah. was, she was like, you know, you get these actors that are method sometimes, so they're going into their dark places, you know, hours before. And that's a little, that's not how I work, but I respect that, so you leave it alone. But, but <laughs> Erica, she's, she's like, you know, being one of the guys, if you will. And then, you know, all of a sudden, Darren's like, all right, you gotta do this scene where she's, you know, so emo and she just turns it on, and I'm like, I'm blown away by it. So uh, it, to me, it's just a fun, you know, lesson every time I'm uh, near a set. You, you mentioned, I believe, in one interview uh, also that you you had a lot of fun choreographing the fight scene with Patrick Wilson for. Oh Insidious. yeah, that was great. Um, you know, actors typically want to do stunts and do fights because you know that's that's where you really get to play physically. Um, I've learned as time goes on that it's not the best idea all the time because when I'm getting older, two stunt guys are do it way better and it looks <laughs> way better. And, and ultimately I take the credit anyhow. So, uh, just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I know, so yes, yeah, so we got some, do some cool stunts and you're, it's a choreography thing and you're dancing and, and Patrick Wilson's, you know, this, I have such huge respect for his talents. He's been some great things. And so for me to, one, work with them at all, be in the same room, and then get to actually physically, you know, mix it up and and, and just collaborate with this 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 A-list type guy is, you know, stunning for me. Stunning, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, brilliant. cool. Well, uh, Hunter, we've got um, a lot of um, um, film students of, of various uh, various specialties uh, in the room. Uh, you work with kind of what comes to you. Uh, what do uh, cinematographers and uh, directors need to keep in mind in horror uh, in shoot, putting their scenes together? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, the best part of the horror, to use the roller coaster analogy, is the going up. You know, the moment before the knife swings or the moment before, it's what's the unseen. It's the things that, you know, are making the weird noises in the dark and stuff. So that's always what I really like. And when you're on a really tight schedule, sometimes that's the hard stuff to get because that's not what's necessarily on the page. That's not what's necessarily right there. Um, and what was really great about working on The Walking Dead for so long was that I was able to call to set and say, I really think that this is a moment that you should go back and get. And there was a, this, an, an example. There was a scene where the group is running from a bunch of zombies and uh, they find a shed in the middle of the woods and they go inside and they shut the door and then they see that there's somebody in the bed and they don't know what's in the bed. They don't know if it's a zombie. They don't know. They have no idea what's going on over there. So they slowly creep over there and what was shot was they go over there and they pull the sheet off and then the guy jumps up and he's a crazy person. <clears throat> so I called to set and it was a director that I hadn't worked with so I didn't know if he was going to be cool with it or not and I was like, you know what I really think you should do is go and get a shot that's a really slow push in on the thing. That's the moment when everyone just walks over and pulls the blanket off, there's no tension. It's like it's revealed. So they actually went and shot, and you know, and I said, you know, get the hand that comes in. And that to me is like the really fun stuff of horror is 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 the is the tension, the unknown, the what is gonna come and happen. And I think, you know, to the topic of success in horror and success in the business in general, um, there's always, you know, and, and and even to your topic of like what scripts to write or whatever, is to find Find a new way to do something. Find a new way to find your way to do something. You know, like I've been editing now for a long time, and um, so I challenge myself to edit like a fight sequence in a totally new way that I ever would. Or you know, because I really enjoy action and cutting action and cutting big scenes like that. 
And so I challenged myself to find like a new way to do it. Like what if we did it with like two edits or what if we flopped a shot? Well, you know, whatever it is, there's always a new way to approach a sequence or what if we told it from somebody else's perspective? Um, and I think that in all ends of the business, I would say with directing as well, because you mentioned that you were doing the same thing, you know, on Saw 4 and you were not challenging yourself. And I think it's always finding a new way to challenge yourself that keeps you fresh and hopefully ahead of the game or at least in the game. Cool, cool. Um, well, movies, as you've mentioned, are hard to get made these days. Uh, you guys did some short films as sort of proof of concept uh, at times. Uh, thoughts for student filmmakers on their big ideas and maybe using a short to uh, get things rolling. And follow up on that, comics, graphic novels, is that a way to get a, a concept out there? Well, okay, so for Abattoir, which I brought here last year and showed my proof of concept, it started as a comic book. Um, and then after the comic book, we did a proof of concept, and then I shot it last or this year in New Orleans. Um, so I'm doing a new movie called Apex, which is a sci-fi action film. Um, we, when I get, when I get back here from Full Sail, I go directly into directing that proof of concept. So even, um, I guess, quote unquote, successful directors still do proof of concepts all the time. Um, I mean, the, here's the reality. It's getting harder and harder to get anything made. Um, and this isn't uh, a negative thing at all. It's, it's a positive thing that less and less movies are going in theatrical. Why? Because, you know, you have Netflix, you have direct TV, you have video on demand. Um, content is easier to access than ever. So as a filmmaker, we have to challenge ourselves. How are we going to stick out amongst the 7,000 titles every month put on Netflix? How are you going to make your film special? And I think that you've got to be creative. We're in entertainment of being creative, yet we re re we're regurgitating the same content over and over and over again. How many spinoffs of Saw are there, movies that are just like it? The reason Saw, I think, hit was it was a unique original concept. Um, so I, I think the thing with proof of concept is you have 90 seconds, two minutes, to create something to show why your movie is special. That's why I do them. Um, but on top of that, what are new ways to tell stories? I mean, Hunter talked about approaching editing that way. What's a new way to, to approach... Uh, a fight scene or a scare scene. I'm now, as a filmmaker, when I did Devil's Carnival, it was how can I create a, an atmosphere that would encourage people to go back to the movies? Has anyone, did anyone go on the Devil's Carnival Roadshow or Repo Roadshow here? Okay, there's a couple, a couple people. Basically, I had a problem. I couldn't get movies in the theaters for many years. It was three years and I didn't have a film in the theaters. They just went straight to video. I love the movies. I love going to, it's like a sanctuary. It's like a religious experience. So how can I do that? So I decided that I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to hire burlesque dancers. I'm going to hire uh, you know, X-rated clowns. I'm going to have live music. I'm going to have a costume contest. I'm going to make it an event. So I made the Devil's Carnival an event that you had to you had to go to, you had to be there to witness it. And because of that, we packed theaters all across the country. And that was me as a, as a creator trying to think, what's the next thing? And to me, let's make the movie an event. So I think when you're thinking about whatever movie you want to make, whatever big idea you have, what's different about it? Why is your movie any different than the, the, all the titles on Netflix or DirecTV right now? Because it, it's a hard time to get movies made, so it's forcing you to be creative. And that's why I think it's, it's actually a cool time, because it's, it's actually making you think, making you be creative. So um, I kind of went off on a different tangent than <laughs> why, why make a that, that commercial yeah. for the Devil's Carnival 2 roadshow that's coming up? Is that your commercial? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, in the Devil's Carnival 2, we'll be here in August. You guys can come see what I'm talking oh. about. But yeah. Uh, Hunter, do you have an answer to that? What was your question? No, I'm sorry, I'm joking. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Good ways was, for proof about, of concept, uh, making, basically. Making, making proof of concept stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's really important, to be, especially as you have, to, you have to have some, well, you have to have content. You have to have, it, it, you can't, like, if you're going to do something, um, you have to go and create media for it to help sell the idea, whether it's a, like, I know before you've, you've shown me that you've done proof of concept drawings and, and, and like, elaborate storyboards of, and whole booklets and everything that you've gone out to help pitch and sell an idea. Or you go and you make a short that sells it, or you make a trailer that sells it, or you create lookbooks that sell it. I mean, you have to find a way to sell people on what you are trying to get them to make for you, or, well, to, or let you make, you know? Well, here's, I mean, here's an example. We made one for Repo, um, and the reason why I did it for Repo was when I said I wanted to make a musical, everyone, I think, immediately went to Oklahoma, or, you know, <laughs> with that kind of, it was, it was like, well, you want to make a musical with people singing? I'm like, no, it's going to be cool, edgy, and sexy. 
And they're like, I don't think anyone got it. And so we went off and said, let me show you what it's going to look like. So we went off and shot 10 minutes, this, this couple of songs. So at least when you walked into a room, they were in my head. And I think it's a hard thing because, you know, when I read a script, if I'm not in your head and I don't understand your voice, I might completely have the wrong vision. Because when you read a script, you're conjuring a vision in your head, what the actors will look like, what the world will look like. But it might be completely wrong. And I think that um, an example, like if and I'm just making this up, but if someone gave me five pages of Sin City and I didn't know what Sin City was supposed to look like, I could think it's terrible. But then when I'm like, oh, wait, it's going to look like this and the characters are going to look like this, that's awesome. So imagine when you do a proof of concept, you're giving your, your audience, here's exactly what I'm talking about, here's what it's going to look like, and here's what the feel is. So when I go into your script or your project, I have a, an image in my brain that I wouldn't have had before. Well, it also is a commitment of time thing. Because a commitment of time of reading a script can be, you know, a couple hours versus a commitment of time of watching a trailer or a short or something can be just a few minutes. And then, then that would prompt you to actually go, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll read the whole script. Which I think also um, means don't make them 20 minutes long either because yes, you'll lose, keep, you'll them, lose it. keep them short. Shorts yeah. are meant to be short. <laughs> and 10 minutes of eh versus one minute of, you know, oh, is it, you're gonna, the one minute's going to be watched to the end. <laughs> well, um, on that note, uh, sort of, it, 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 this goes to personal opinion a bit, I think, but what are the best scares to each of you? Uh, Living with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is being uh, live stream, brother. I know. I'm just um, right now, packing her bags. <laughs> she's probably watching. I'm <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think that for me, I things that are in the, in the realm of realism scare me a lot more than things that are not. Um, I love Nightmare on Elm Street movies. I think they're fun. But I, I don't believe that Freddy Krueger is going to come get me in my dreams. They're just an escape. I think they're fun. But if I watch something like The Strangers or Funny Games, that terrifies me because that happens. That, that is real. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think things that are in the realm of believability terrifies me a lot more than things that are not. Um, so, I mean, like even with the Barons, um, Barons is based on rabies, and rabies is a real thing that causes it causes hallucinations. And so, for example, I mean, that, that terrifies me more than, you know, just, my, I, I just think that things that could happen, but not necessarily would, to me, are the, the biggest scares for me. I'm not saying that you can't make a monster movie scary. There's plenty of monster movies that are scary, but... I always like to put myself in the position of the victim. And if I can imagine myself in that position, then to me, that's, that's terrifying. See, uh, just to <clears throat> counter that for discussion, because I actually agree with you, The Strangers is fantastic, but I also like a little bit of magic in, in movies. Like, yeah. I love like The Burbs, which is like a ridiculous comedy, and they're fearful that their neighbors are the, you know, killing people. And, and uh, I, just, I, like, I love that tone, like, the little bit, like a slightly off-kilter tone to the horror to me. Um, is very enjoyable, but I like I watched The Strangers in the middle of the day, and I was like freaking out with everything around me because like I was in that world. I felt like that exactly like you, like that, that could actually happen to me. Uh, but a little bit of magic's fun too. I like monster movies, yeah. personally. Jay, yeah, I like I, I love monster movies, but they don't necessarily scare me, you know. Um, but they're su super entertaining, and I and I love the scene. But I, you know, it's the suspense thing or the not knowing. But but for sure, what Darren mentioned is the the reality. Um, to, where you can relate to it. I think that, you know, we can all relate to a paper cut. You know, they're, they're little and they're simple, but they're annoying as hell. But if your head's chopped up and you got fountains of blood coming out, it, it doesn't scare me or hurt me or even gross me out really anymore. But, uh, but it's the things that you run around. That's why even our little scene in uh, Saw, ripping skin, no. you know, it's just very relatable. And even when I was just in makeup, looking down at these great makeup artists doing my thing, it looks so real, you know, I start getting flush and it's, you know, it's kind of freaking me out. So that's what, in, uh, on the screen, um, you know, you can, something you can identify with and imagine much easier than, uh, than you get decapitated. Well, um, and speaking along those lines, uh, taste is in the synopsis of our, our panel today, so I have to ask a question. Uh, we're in kind of an era where certainly anything can be accomplished visually, makeup-wise and everything, and certainly we can have unrated versions, so anything goes. Uh, when are there times that creators need to think about restraint, and when is it important to think less is more in horror? 
or do we need to think less well, this morning? Well, I mean, we can we can be very specific with the shot from Mother's Day, if you, with uh, uh, Tony's head. Oh uh, yeah, so Adley, we yeah. yeah. I mean, there it, it's crazy. The older I get, the more my my own subjective tastes are changing. I have a kid now. Um, there's certain things I won't touch now. I won't do, and it's crazy because it, it happened almost instantaneously. Like, and I think you told me this uh, when when you had your kid. You said it, all of a sudden things are going to change. Like you're going to look at things differently. And yeah, I haven't gone uh, back and watched the Mist since yeah, I had a kid. Yeah, I mean, it, it freaks me out. It, 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 it's crazy because now, like, things that I used to find cool and edgy, I'm disgusted by. And I was like, why would I even do that? But um, mother, he's talking about Mother's Day. And there was a scene in Mother's Day where a guy um, is, uh, is fighting with another guy with a shotgun. And, and the gun goes off and blows his head off. I had the coolest shot of this guy's head evaporating. And it was a... It was, it was fantastic. A it was a prosthetic shot. And like, we, the, the face looked 100% real. And it blood went everywhere. And I giggled like a schoolgirl when it happened. And oh, I giggled when it came into the dailies. I was calling people in the hall to be like, come and look at this. Come and look at this. We've got three cameras on his head exploding. It's amazing. And, and it, was, it was awesome. And, and it then it beautiful. melted and like folded down the wall. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was so great. It was beautiful. It was a it was the beautiful head explosion. Fantastic. And uh, Hunter and I got in the edit room, and I was like, dude, it would be so much cooler if we didn't see it. And I we decided, my original idea with Mother's Day, and I wasn't able to do this, but I wanted. Um, if, if you haven't seen Mother's Day, it's a, it's a it's a vicious home invasion, based on a real story, a true story, um, but it's a vicious home invasion. And I said, I want to shoot the most fucked up, disturbing movie in the world as a Disney film. I want to have no, I don't want to see one thing on camera. And I want the audience to be disgusted by the sound and the reactions of other people. And no one would go for it. They said that was too artsy and too whatever. So we ended up shooting the vicious ver the version of it. But on one moment of it, when this guy's head exploded, I, we decided to go back to that idea of playing it completely on the reaction of his girlfriend. So the, my phone's ringing, it's probably my wife. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, uh, I was terrified. Darren? <laughs> um, five minute delay kicked yeah. in. <laughs> um, the idea was that this, when this guy's head explodes, instead of seeing it, w which was an awesome shot, we cut to the wife hearing it and watching it and her breakdown and her. And then out of focus, you cut back to the guy who accidentally shot it and he's reacting, but out of focus, you see this bloody thing kind of sinking. Remember that? Yeah. It was a great shot. And we also did a couple of those type of things in, in Mother's Day where. Um, there was a, a, every time someone was tortured on screen, instead of really focusing on the torture, we focused on the loved one who was watching the torture. That to me is scary. Real emotion is scary. And I think that to me now, like five years ago, I would have said, let's show the head exploding. Five years ago, I would have said, let's show the torture. Now, I think it's cooler to watch the reaction to the torture because that's true terror. That's fear. Real human emotion, that's scary. Blood sporting out of a thing, that's not scary. That's just gross. Scary is watching reaction, watching the person crumble emotionally. That to me is disturbing and gut-wrenching. But is there a line? Yeah, there's a line. But I mean, I... I the thing which is cool about, I think, horror is, yeah, we are allowed to cross it, and we do get to cross this, and that's what makes movies great, is that that stuff does exist if you want to watch it. I just choose now not to do some of it. Well, it's also what's cool about horror is that it's where you get to play with some of the stuff, because it is a lower budget. You know, it's less of a risk. So you are able to do some, like, newer things. I don't mean just, like, gory, bloody, like, crossing the line, or but yes, that too. Um, but you also just get to play and explore with different ways of doing things and hope that, you know, that it works and, and you get to experiment a little bit. But I think that where the line comes from, like, when I, we did uh, Dust Till Dawn, the, the TV series, and there was, like, three versions of that that we put out there, and, you know, there was one version, I forget all the different versions, it was such a crazy show, but one version that was just American violence, and it was like blood and gore and heads being ripped off and exploded and all the, I mean, it was just over the top insanity. It had a little bit of that magic that I was talking about. But then there was also the like international version for Europe where we put in all the topless women because it takes place in a strip joint. And then there was another version that was like all the topless, and we finally got to where we called it Nudity plus language. It was like the new, <laughs> and, and so then the final version was like all the all the nudity and all the fucks and all the stuff that you were supposed to take out for all the other stuff, and I don't know. In that show, was there a line? I don't I don't know. I don't know if there was. I never. Did know you ever forget which show. version you were working on? Oh my gosh! Yeah, no, we never. It was it was <laughs> maddening. It was absolutely maddening. But it was a uh, it was a really really cool show. And if you're into that type of stuff, I recommend checking it out. Do you know what I also want to point out is that when I made the Saw movies, um, we always had a, a battle with the MPAA, always every single time. 
And now when you watch, if you watch Fargo or you watch Sons of Anarchy or you watch any of these shows that are on TV, there are a thousand, if you watch Hannibal, there is yeah. so much more violence in the first 30 seconds of Hannibal than any Saw movie. And it's crazy because as an American audience, we become desensitized. I watch Hannibal and I'm like, how are they getting away with this? And that's on, that's on TV. Dude, I'm, I cut an episode for the CW. 15 people died on camera in the first 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I mean. 10 of them were slaughtered by teenagers with axes and knives. And then I'm told that we can't show a man commit suicide. On the, it, it, it's, it's, so, it's so funny, the so standards, the standards, standards of practices. practices. Yeah. It's like uh, American tastes are like so crazy right now. Um, I, yeah, I What's think, the line? Yeah, I knows? mean, if you watch the following, one of my friends is on the following last season, the, the season opened up with a train and the six or seven people just get stabbed repetitively before the title card of the following. I mean, stabbed in the throat, stabbed in the heart, stabbed in whatever. That's on Fox. Dude, the pilot to the following was insane. I remember watching, I texted my agent and I said, I want, I want to, this is the type of show I want to be on. There was so, there was so much blood on the The following is my calling. <laughs> So, awesome. but, and I think that that's what I'm saying is it's also become harder as, as filmmakers trying to do horror because part of what horror used to be was trying to shock and scare the audience. Why is someone going to pay, you know, $15 to go see a movie when if they turn on network TV that they get for free in their home, they can get the same scares. So it also, we have to redesign horror movies. We have to redesign what is scary because now it's, you know, you can see it for free on TV. Well, do you think that that has brought back kind of a, a gothic feel to some films um, and kind of the old fashioned imagination uh, horrors? I hope so. Any of you? We see paranormal activity, things like that, that are kind of ghost house, uh, returning to the ghost house. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, to me, that's, it's all really exciting. I think it's, uh, I. I really do enjoy all the different forms, uh, like like Darren was saying, there's so many different genres of horror. My, the, the, when, but like, my wife makes funny, whenever I have time at, at home by myself, I watch just horror movies on Netflix and I binge through them. Um, and, uh, but I won't, I won't typically sit down and watch the like stalker film, but I would sit down and watch the like, you know, creepy crawly stuff in the middle of the night. Paranormal Activity is another one that I watched like alone in the middle of the day and just like scared the crap out of me. I kind of <laughs> say I was really late coming to watching that one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think it like everything, it kind of goes through the cycles. And when there was the cycle where like the torture point, the splat pack guys, right. uh, you know, and then it kind of like moved a little bit away from that. But that element's still there. And I think it just kind of it's all going through different cycles. Different cycles. Yeah. Um, well, we've been talking a lot about Netflix. Certainly, VOD, Netflix, things like that are getting a lot of um, things, a, a version of distribution. Uh, is that, uh, for, for new horror creators, do you see that as a good thing, um, good opportunities, um, those different channels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because with every channel that comes out, they need content, they need programming. When they need programming, that means they need shows to fill it. So there's more options now than ever for filmmakers to, to get something in. I think the challenge with that is, is that for a movie, you have 90 minutes. You have 90 minutes to tell the story and create characters. Now you have 13 hours to, to try to fill something, and sometimes more than that. Um, I mean, for me, I like TV more than I like movies at this point, because if you look at something like True Detective, I mean, that is such an engaging, uh, amazing, disturbing, beautiful show. And instead of, again, think about it, you have 90 minutes to connect with a character in a movie, or you have hours and hours and hours and hours to connect with a character on something like True Detective. So when I walk away from True Detective, I feel something. I feel something for those characters. There's a lot of movies I don't feel anything about. So I think, you know, TV is getting very exciting now. I'm jealous of, of people that get to work well, in TV. Well, especially since there's so many, <clears throat> so many outlets for it now, and there's so many different brands and styles. I mean, you know, like I said, when we were on the El Rey network, I mean, it was, it was just there was no line it was fantastic and like the basic cable world where i've mostly done stuff for there's we're really able to like push the boundary of what's allowed and like we don't know sometimes when we do it like if we're going to be allowed to do mm -hmm. it um i remember when we were on the shield we were we were like we're allowed to say like all these bad words we wanted to say like but there was like this crazy guy and he was like bitch ass bitch ass something 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 and like they were like literally got a note that was like you need to remove one of the asses in his line but the other bitch asses are all okay and we're like but which one i don't understand i mean but so i mean i mean you know so television really is getting to push it now and so you can explore a lot of this stuff with the horror world and yeah. go into it it's fun
Someone, someone needs to get closer to the mic. Uh, oh, I'm going to vote sure. me. I, I push it. <laughs> Let's all move closer to our mics. Um, well, one thing that's uh, being talked about a lot in horror these days, um, uh, with uh, in the wake of Dracula Untold, uh, Universal is looking at maybe bringing a shared world um, series of films out in the vein of Mar what Marvel's doing. There's talk of uh, insidious and uh, sinister crossovers, of course. You have an uh, insidious background. Uh, it, do you find that exciting, interesting to see maybe series of films and um, film universes again? Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course. I think that, again, for me, I would much rather see original horror than I would see, you know, and again, this is where I think I've changed in the last, in the last few years. Um, I think the Marvel Universe is awesome. It is. But I am as excited about seeing something new like It Follows, which is like a new original type of horror. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, again, it goes to that whole idea of subgenres of horror. That's, that's a subgenre of horror, what you're talking about. I mean, if, if the Dracula mixing with Frankenstein and going back and redoing those universal monsters. Um, I didn't know about Insidious for Sinister. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I had no idea about that. I'm still waiting for Jigsaw in Space versus Leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> And I've told him I want to direct the natural <laughs> progression, right? Yeah, it, it all comes down to the story too, and the entertainment. They could do whatever they want, but if the story's not there, it's going to suck. And if the yeah. story's great, it, you know, it's going to be a great story. So uh, you know, and and so it's about the writing, really. I think. Well, um, we've got people with microphones in the audience out there lurking around. I think. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Uh, Nice. A couple here. All right. Uh, two down, sort of down front here. Hi, my name is Emily Masonette. Um, I'm in the game art program. And recently, uh, Norman Reedus and Guillermo del Toro got involved in the Silent Hill franchise, video games. Um, do you think that's going to be a trend of like directors and stuff moving over into that medium because? you know, it's becoming a little bit more legitimate. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I mean, like, I love, uh, first off, the thing is, I was talking about, there's so much content now. There's so many movies. How do you tell a story in a new and unique way? And I think for the last four or five years, I have been kind of um, on this journey about how to reinvent a narrative. And this, this is going to sound weird, and I, I, I'm going to sound stupid even saying it, because you're going to be like, what, you, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I keep saying that. I keep dropping F-bombs. Um, I, I, I have an idea about how to reinvent or try a new approach at telling a story, narrative storytelling. And it started when I went to Sleep No More in New York. And if you have not been to Sleep No More in New York as, a, as an artist, you, stop what you're doing. Everyone leave this lecture right now. Get on a plane and drive to fly to New York and, and see it. Um, and basically, it was the idea of Sleep No More is... It's free world roaming that you basically walk into a warehouse and there are actors that are putting on a play, but you decide what actor you want to follow. And each actor has their own storyline going through it. And it, it kind of hurts your head the first time you do it, but it's the most beautiful thing I've seen, which led me on this journey of, I just got back from Tokyo, went to London, and I've been seeing all of these, um, what they're called immersive theaters. Um, and I think that there, there are different ways to tell stories than a 90 minute sitting in a theater. Video games is another thing. There are beautiful video games out there. Gone Home, um, which is, a, if you guys haven't played that, it's an amazing story that unfolds around you. Um, there was a, and I'm going to mess the name up, a game I played recently, Heavy Rain or Hard Rain, I forget the name of it. Heavy Rain. I mean, that, that's a beautiful story, and it was amazing. And I think that why I got into filmmaking is I wanted to tell stories. I didn't want to make movies, I wanted to tell stories. And so it find the medium that works for you. Video games, that's an awesome medium to tell a story. Um, and, it, and it requires more of an audience member than being passive. Think about it, when you really think about it, like I want to engage people, I want to move people, I want to inspire people. I don't want people to be bored and passive. You know, now when you look at a movie theater, people are on their cell phones, they're texting, they're talking, they're you know, looking at their popcorn, whatever. And I think because they're passive, let's engage the audience. Let's make them feel a part of something. Let's inspire them. That's part of what the Devil's Carnival was about, was getting them in a the theater to have fun. And Devil's Carnival, we want you to sing. We want you to dance. We want you to be loud. We want you to wear weird costumes. That's why Rocky Horror is amazing. Rocky Horror embraces a community and say, it's okay to be weird. It's okay to be loud. It's okay to be accepted for who and what you are. 
too many movies now are just lame. You sit there and I forget about, I can't tell you half the movies I see because I forget about them while I'm watching them. I take naps <coughs> when I watch movies because they're, they're just eye candy and that's it. I don't want to make eye contact. I don't want to make eye contact candy. <laughs> I want to make art. And if that is video games, then, then so be it. And I think that we as filmmakers and artists should look at whatever medium we can to tell stories. Okay, and thank you for that. And we have another question out there, I believe. Uh, okay, first of all, I just want to say I'm a huge fan. And if doing Saw was lazy work, then you are a genius. Because <laughs> those are my favorite movies. It sparked my favorite catchphrase, like, I want to play a game. Anyways, but my question <laughs> is, um, what, what went through your head creating these kinds of movies? They're so good. They're my favorite horror movies. Thank like you. Of all time, what goes through your head to create these things? I am the lamest, laziest, uh, most normal person in the world. Like I literally, I have a cat and like two fluffy dogs and <laughs> I, I, I live in a bright airy house and like you would never, I don't live in like a dungeon and, and sac well I do sacrifice people but that's a, that's a whole other. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so it's crazy, it's just that um, you know, it's funny, the horror community in Hollywood is so super small, everyone knows everyone. <laughs> and um, it, there's a, one of my favorite memories, and this will answer, go back to answer your question. There is a dinner, it's, a, it's supposed to be a top secret dinner that happens once a month or twice a month, um, I'm sorry, a couple times a, a year. Uh, it's called the Masters of Horror Dinner. And I got invited after Saw 2 came out, and I got this, I've told this story before, but I got a phone call. And it was Eli Roth, and I didn't know Eli. And he goes, hey, Darren, um, come to this address, come by yourself, don't bring anyone. And I was like, okay, this is really weird, am I gonna get in some weird cult? And I show up, and as I show up, it's, it's Guillermo del Toro, Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Eli Roth, James Wan, John McNaughton, it was like uh, the guy who directed The Burbs, uh, Joe Mick Dante. Garris, Joe Dante, everyone was sitting around this table. And they're the nicest, friendliest, happiest like people. And like it was one step away from all of us singing Kumbaya. I was like, everyone was just so happy. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking over there and I see Wes Craven and I'm like, oh my God, you did Last House on the Left. And I see Guillermo and I'm like, Pan's Labyrinth and I'm doing this, but they're so friendly and happy. And so I wish I can give you some awesome answer that like I'm really screwed up in the head and I'm on, you know, like I'm dangerous, but it's not. I think that's why uh, the horror filmmakers are, were, it's just fun. To me, it's, it, it's fun. And I think if you would ever come on a set, you would realize you would be really disappointed. You would like literally see us like having whoopee cushions and like dropping stink bombs and like it's, it's, it's fun. That said, I think the reason it's fun and the reason we can do this is we're able to expel our demons. We have an avenue to do it. We have an avenue to say, you know, I'm mad at somebody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exaggerate that anger in something horrific. And then I get it out of my system. It's cathartic. And I think that that's what's so fun about it is I think that the, the dangerous ones, the ones that you hear about are ones that have no avenues to expel their demons. And so the, the, the rage, everything builds up inside of them. But I think for me, I'm probably really happy because I get to kill people on screen all the time. And <laughs> very, very happy about that. Um, and it, one other thing to say, uh, where the ideas come from, I'll give you Saw 2 for example. I'll give you like three examples in Saw 2. Uh, the, the, the Saw 2 opens with a guy who slits his eyes with a razor blade. I, everything that's in Saw 2, or a lot of it, is things of real things for me that, that I'm exaggerating. So I've had numerous eye surgeries. The first eye surgery I had when I was six months, and then I had, my last one was when I was 13 years old. When I was 13 years old, I, this is one of the most horrific experiences I can remember growing up. Um, I went in for eye surgery, and this is before LASIK, so there was, there was scalpel. And I woke up in a gurney, and they, I was against a wall, it was, it, was, it was upright, and they said, Darren, open your eyes. When I opened my eyes, I had to cry out the blood, because there was blood in my eye, and I had to open my eyes to let it all go down. And so that's where Saw 2 opening came from. I have a phobia of needles. So what's scarier than needles? A million needles. So everything and, you know, everything. <laughs> a, pit, a pit of needles. <laughs> so, so everything is an exaggeration of my own weird dementia of certain things. So I take something small and elevate it to something big. That's where that stuff comes from. I'm joking. I'm really screwed up in the head. <laughs> I'm dangerous. Uh, other questions? I see other people with hands. Oh, I think someone's right here with one. Sorry. Hello, I'm Andrea. Duke it out. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. And um, I'm going to, I'm planning on doing a short film, horror short film, and the girls get skilled at the end. How do I get the people to watch the short film, or how do I make a summary that I don't say anything about that, because that's the surprise part. 
you just told everyone that you just on you just on that you just told everyone <laughs> what your surprise is. Yeah, that's lesson um, one. I mean, listen. Here, here's what I do uh, on if you're doing a short film and you want to surprise people. Um, actually, Hunter, I'm gonna let you answer that from an editorial standpoint because I mean, a lot of it comes to. Why don't you take this one? <clears throat> I'm sorry. What, so, what specifically happens at the end that you're trying to? Don't make her say it again. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't mind. It's like it looks like a normal short film. Right. At the end, it happens to be a horse short film, and the girl gets killed. Right. So you're trying to figure out like how to when you have you already shot it? No, no, no. It's okay. Just, well, I mean, I think that you have to find a stylistic way to go about doing that, right? That you lead. I mean, that's the that's the fun with a twist is that you send it in a completely different direction. So I think that you just need to tee it up like it's a very normal, whatever your story is, like that is the story until the moment that it's not. And then visually, I think, and with sound and everything, and you just immediately have to switch that gear. Right? Well, I think, I, well, I think that, um, well, I love doing this in movies and it's, some movies have lead up to scares, build up. They have the loud like stinger or the heartbeat or the, the heavy breaths and you know something bad's gonna happen. Do it where nothing like that happens, where it's so shocking and yeah. so out of the blue that you're you're immediately surprised. Like, did that? Like, for example, don't have the scary music. Don't have the the foreboding drone that's about to happen. No, you need to set up the beginning. Like, it is that is the point of the story. Whatever the goal is, that's established from the like whatever your conflict, whatever you're trying to overcome. That is what it's about. Until it's not about that, right? Then you've got your big twist. So, and I agree with Darren. Don't give any foreshadowing that that's coming. Like, let that let that just happen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know you said that you're a bit tired of not many original ideas in the horror industry, but I was. But I would direct Saw Eight. I'm just saying that right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. it's, I was. I was thinking of trying to, in a way, do a horror film or just a try to fund a horror film based off like so a creepy pasta. Which there is a person on YouTube named Mr. Creepy Pasta who does almost like a uh, radio theater of these creepy pastas and almost makes it feel like a movie. Um, if you were to do a uh, movie based off a of creepy pasta, um, how would you? I can't take creepy pasta seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm scary ravioli. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not familiar. Okay. Wait, are they cooked or is it? I actually have seen creepy pasta. Have they're, you? They're, they're, yeah, it's, the uh, it's, uh, the it's, creepy pasta most people know is uh, Thin Man. Man. The Thin Man. Oh, is, uh, I apologize. Yes, yeah, okay, Slender yeah, Man yeah. and Slender Man. Uh, yeah, Slender Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, and I've, I've, when I when I heard creepy pastas, I was like, you like. Creepy food, <laughs> right? But, yes. Um, using that as like since it's not really structured as an actual story, it's just like maybe small inserts of this and that. How would you, in a way, make a movie uh, using uh, creepy pasta? But creepy pasta, if I'm if I'm correct in it, it's users put stories up and they put pictures up and they do whatever. Mm -hmm. That's intellectual property. That's their intellectual property. Now, you, I mean, what you're saying is how would you, you'd probably contact the people who tell the stories. Like, I, I read one that was terrifying on, on uh, I'm not even going to say the name because I can't take it seriously, but there's one where the, the people, like, do an experiment and it's about, like, there are 30 days without sun and they turn into these horrible creatures. I forget what it is, but I saw, mm. that, that's it. I mean, there, there is some really, some, some really yeah. s s scary stuff in that, but I think that, again, if you were going to try to tell, uh, you're almost like you're saying an anthology, just tell a, mm -hmm. a movie of, of multiple stories, you would have to reach out to those people who put the stories up there and say, hey, I want to take your story and put it towards whatever, or contact the site, Creepypasta. But some of them are actual real stories, right? People have actually gone out and killed. Yeah, there, there's like, a so girl, I mean, there's yeah. two girls actually just, uh, just attacked so, I mean, their friends. So that's a true yeah. story. Yeah, and that part That's of a it true is. story that's out into the public. I mean, I don't know if that's the angle that you would like to go with, but um, I mean, that's, that's public domain though if that since it's real life hunter and i've actually been working for a while on ludicrous lasagna <laughs> <laughs> kind of in the early stages that we're talking about um but i i i would recommend this i mean there's there's a couple of ways you know what's really funny that i don't think a lot of people realize is is that um you people that actually i'm trying to think how to, how to, how to word it in the, in the right way People are sometimes scared thinking that they'll never get the rights to something, and sometimes all you have to do is ask. Um, I have researched, I have a crazy, it's a crazy story that there was a book that my wife's mother gave me, and she said, this is the scariest book I've ever read, you have to read it. And I read the book, and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I sent a letter to the author of the book, 
and I got the rights for one dollar. Now this, this is a book, I couldn't believe that no one else had had it, and he, he, when he gave me the rights of the book, he said, ironically, you're the second director to take the rights of this book, and the first director, Alfred Hitchcock, and, and it was crazy, I got it for a dollar, and I never in a million years thought that I could have got something like that, and all I did was ask. And sometimes you, all you have to do is ask. I know Stephen King has a Stephen whole King, thing. Yeah. Stephen King has a whole thing that he'll give you a first his, his thing for a dollar. Yeah. So, you know, I would say just ask. The worst that's going to happen is they say no. And it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this is don't be scared to fail. You might hear a thousand no's. All it takes is one yes. I heard no a thousand times, and I heard yes one time, and that was saw too. So just don't be scared to fail. Um. Before we take another in-room question, we do have an online question uh, from uh, Victoria Webster. Um, and this is for Jay. Would you say it's a good thing or a bad thing to get typecast in the horror genre? Does it make it easier to get work if you try to stick with a specific genre of movie? Well, uh, you know, I mean, in, in my case, I've been in a few horror films because, like I mentioned earlier, you, there's a lot of networking involved in this business. So I got into a Saw film, which puts me in that little community there, which led to you know uh, being introduced to James Wan and Insidious. So, you know, it's just, just kind of a way things work is networking and you network, you, typically it ends up being in that genre. But that said, um, for me personally, I just kind of want to work, you know, so, so I want interesting characters. I want challenging characters. And to be typecast, that's, that's fine. You know, I get typecast a bit because my hair and junk, and that's, you know, I cut it, I want. Which he doesn't tell a lot of people is a wig. Yeah, yeah, it's a wig. It comes off. Um, but, but so is it bad? I don't know. I guess that's personal opinion. Does it mean you're getting work? I think that's a good thing. If the, you know, too bad, you know, that I, I don't have much sympathy for some of the. But on that note, Every audition I get, you know, sometimes I'll go through a bunch of auditions where I'm constantly getting the same type of role, which is fine. And I, I wish I had my choices. I wish I was a big enough actor where I could say, uh, you know, I want that role and, and go get it for me. But so I, I don't I don't think it's bad necessarily, but that's personal opinion. I just want to work. So if it means I have to work a horror movie for the rest of my life. If they're cool characters and they're in cool movies and I'm working with cool people, then I, I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter to me. But, uh, but of course, I'd like to play a romantic comedy. I'd like to be a dad that doesn't get killed in the first two minutes. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, so I want challenges, but I don't think it's bad. Whenever I get work, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm very happy and appreciative, do, so. Do you have a favorite role of horror or otherwise? That I've done already? Yeah, mean? yeah. Um, no, you know. There's different reasons for having, like, Saw was great because it was my first thing that actually was in a theater, you know? I mean, that, that, so that's going to always have a special place. Um, but no, because they're all, uh, again, going back to the kind of appreciating, because it's such a hard business. It's so hard to get, you know, decent work. When you finally do, it's pretty much a joyous occasion. And, uh, and I appreciate it. And again, when I said before, I'm on set, I'm learning, even if the role's small, I'm still I have an opportunity to be in front of these other people that I get to watch and learn and open up hopefully new doors, make new relationships that will lead. I've worked with the same directors a couple times and I, I'm hoping that's because I'm not a pain in the ass to work with. You know, I'm an okay actor, good enough to at least, you know, let make the editor make it work. And, uh, you know, so, but I just always, I'm so appreciative just to be there that I yeah. I look at every one as a as a really great a experience. To yeah, the, yeah. <clears throat> right. You know, to, to back to like continuing to find success, Jay. I think you said something that was interesting, which is that when you're on set, you're watching how other people are doing things, yeah. and I think that's that's really important is to always be trying to learn from somebody else, see how other people are doing it on television. There's multiple editors. We always watch each other's work, or we try to to see how somebody else approached something. Um, pick up from a director, pick up from anybody, anybody that's involved in the creative process. Just pick up yeah. something new, a new trick from them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, we've got, oh. <coughs> okay. Hey guys, uh, the question that I have is with the surprise at the end of a movie or with video games, every time we see some new form of entertainment, we do become desensitized directly after and it's hard to, to get that connection back. Is there a basic element you, you feel to build off of that can still draw us to, to a reaction and to that connection 
I think anytime you can take an old convention and do something completely new with it, which I think re gives new hope. Um, and I'm trying to think of, a, of an example of, of a movie that uh, is, is done it recently. And I'm, I'm, but you always see, I mean, it's, it comes out of nowhere. You'll see copycats. You'll see 100 movies about vampires. Then all of a sudden, you'll see a let the right one in. And all of a sudden, it reinvigorates what that, what that, ti that, that kind of tired uh, stereotype is. Um, I think that it's trying to find a completely new and unique approach at doing the same thing you've seen a thousand times. And I think that's hard. Like, there's only so many ways you can kill somebody. So try to do it in a different way. For example, like, don't show the death at all. Only show the reaction of the person who's watching the death, which I was trying to do on Mother's Day. <clears throat> Have you seen Kingsman? No, I heard that's great, though. It's fantastic. And there's an amazingly brutal scene in it. And... I'm sorry, I don't, is, am I going to give anything away? I, I'm not going to give anything away. It'll be fine. There's an ama the, but the way, that they, the way that they put together that sequence, so that's a sequence like, to this point that, that we've all seen a lot, and I've cut that scene or something similar to it times before. It's very violent, and, and everyone's fighting and killing each other. But then it ends in this amazingly cool way that like, really freaked me out, and this guy ends up with like, a thing through his a big pole that's going through his scalp and, and poking out. And, it, and so it's been really big and loud and violent and bloody and everything. And then it just ends on this guy settling and settling and settling down the pole. And it was fantastic. So they found a new way to like tell the same thing. <laughs> and I just remember looking at, leaning over to my wife and going, oh, Just give it so away. Great. Thanks a lot. Man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys. Uh, Tom and Julie. I'm in the creative writing for entertainment uh, BFA. Um, I have a two-parter, actually. Uh, the first one is for writing. Um, what would be your best advice on getting your work out there in front of people? And the secting, second would be for acting. Uh, what material would you say would be best to put on your acting reel? So. Um, for the writing thing, I mean, it, here's the reality. It's hard. It really is hard to get your stuff seen, but it's not impossible if you're smart. Um, I, for me, if I, if I were starting over again and I was saying, if, because I started as a writer. I didn't start as a director. I started selling screenplays before I ever directed anything. Um, I would shoot, I would have, even if not you directing, I would have someone direct something of yours in, in short form content. So if you have a, a five minute thing to show someone that you can write, I, here's the problem. You get in a catch 22. In Hollywood, no one will read your script, unsolicited material. Not because I don't want to. You can have the best script in the world. It comes down to similarities in movies. So let's say that I'm working on a movie about, uh, let's say I'm working on Fearful Fettuccine. And at the, at the same time, you hand me a project for you know, the creepy pasta. Unbeknownst to me, we have the, basically the same idea. You could sue me, and you could say, "Well, I gave him creepy pasta," and I'd be like, "Well, I had fearful fettuccine," and and mm -hmm. uh, I get sued because of that. So no one wants to read unsolicited material. I will watch a short film. I will do that. Also, reading scripts. I, I don't like reading scripts, and, and I think Hunter brought it up. Why? I have a busy life. I'm in post production on three movies right now. I have a newborn kid. I I have all this shit going on. Reading a script takes me four hours. It, four hours, and I, I'm a I, I have, I'm a slow reader, but I will watch a, a, a 90 minute movie. I will watch a, a 10 minute short. So if I like the short and I like the writing on the short, I'll immediately ask to see the material. Then I'll do, a, I'll go out of my way to actually get approval to read the script, but I would never just read an unsolicited script. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, Hunter? You know well, and then, uh, yeah, well then your next question was uh, acting real, right? Yeah. That's you. Um, well, for me, I mean, I think one danger actors have is putting too much, making uh, the demo too long, you know, because they, 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 or they have limited material, so they figure they'll, instead of just showing a little bit of that limited material, they'll show the whole thing. And that's become, no, people have very short attention spans, and so have your best stuff on there and keep it just about you. You know, I know I've got, so, I've got like a scene with, um, you know, an actor, and I and I wanted like Stephen Moyer. So of course I want to show off. Hey, I worked with Stephen Moyer. You know, it's really cool. And um, but they don't. They know Stephen can work, so they don't need to see him. So it's supposed to focus in on me. I mean, and that thing. But um, and and it used to be you had a five-minute demo reel with a bunch of you know like a montage, you know, a bunch of different things. Nowadays it's I think going more towards clips. You know, short clips that maybe you send if you're auditioning for a certain job send them the clip that's kind of relatable or maybe that was show you in the best light for what the role you're going after. 
Darren, you know, he sees about a gazillion yeah. um, I, demos. So he, well, I was going to say, uh, this is, again, the reality. There's, there's what you think, and then there's the reality of how it really works. And the casting reality is much different than I think actors think. And I was talking to Jay about that re recently. Uh, there was an article that came out of South by Southwest, and they said 7% of an actor who gets a role has anything to do with acting. The other, the other, everything else has to do with, do you look the right part? Um, do you know someone on the production? Are you in the city they're filming it? They said 7% of, of movies, the actors, are actually because of the talent they have. One thing I look for as a director, I see a lot of demo reels that come to me, and an actor will try to put 15 things on it, and it's obvious he shot it just for the acting reel, and it's terrible. It's flatly lit. It, it looks bad. I would rather see one elegant-looking thing for 30 seconds to make me pay attention than 10 crappy things that are flatly lit that look like he shot it against a wall somewhere to read me a monologue. So again, you're at full sale. There are directors here. There are cinematographers here. There are production designers. There are all these people. It would be better to, again, and this is why, again, going back to the synergy of full sale and why you guys are in an amazing place right now, no matter what you want to be, so I'm just going to take acting and writing, then there is a cinematographer that wants to get a cinematography wheel and a director that wants to get a director's reel. Get together and say, put what you guys want out of it. I want to be, I want to get an awesome acting reel. And I'm really good at, let's do an action thing. And then have a cinematographer do a, get together and all benefit each other. Like everyone gets something out everyone of it. Everyone gets yeah. something yeah. out of it. But you're all self-serving, but you're all helping each other in the same thing. Do that. But for me, my thing is this. Make it look good. Make it sound good. Don't just put yourself against a wall saying something. Because I, I'll, I'll tune out. And there was someone, there was, a, there was a student here yesterday that we saw, and I forget, I forget what his name is. I don't was. remember his name was either. Um, he, he, his demo reel or his, his scenes that he showed me were amazing. And I immediately, Hunter and I both were like, oh my God, that's, that's awesome. It was really intimidating. I wish I knew his name. He, it was, this guy was great. And it just looked professional. And if it looked professional, I took him immediately seriously because he took himself seriously. And uh, I well, it was done in a confident manner. It wasn't done. I think one of the things, and I know that I was guilty of this when I was in school and when I came out of school, was you feel like your resume doesn't have enough stuff on it, or you feel like you don't have enough stuff on your reel or whatever it may be, so you kind of pad it so that you're like, well, uh, you know, a, a reel should be, I've heard reels are five minutes. I have to have five minutes of material. But you don't have to have five minutes of material. You know, you don't have to hit those benchmarks. Only put forward what is absolutely the best. And so go make something that's awesome, right? I would and, rather see 30 seconds of great than four minutes of okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. That goes for everything, even those short films you guys got to do each month. <laughs> okay, down in front. Uh, I'm uh, Tim Hughes. I come in the uh, Film Bachelor's program. My question is, um, what are the films that introduced all of each one of you to uh, the horror genre, and did they still have the same effect on you as the first time you saw them? Yeah, they, they do. Um, I, I think the first movie that ever, there was, there was three of them. My brother, uh, you, Someone asked me earlier how I come up with these movies, or if I, and I really am disturbed because the three movies that I saw as a kid growing up, um, Last House on the Left, Cannibal Holocaust, and Henry Porter of a Serial Killer, I saw those when I was 10. And um, I remember Last House on the Left particularly disturbed me. Um, Cannibal Holocaust, I wanted to vomit. And then uh, Henry Porter of a Serial Killer made me want to take a shower. <laughs> and um, those are the three movies that I think really disturbed me. Um, the Shining, and Clockwork Orange, though, showed me the beauty in, in the horror genre as well. So they're, 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 they're opposite ends of the spectrum. You have, you have the, the first three movies that are vicious and violent. And there's nothing vicious, really, or violent about The Shining. It's just an amazingly beautiful, well-shot, elegant movie. No, The Shining's all about tension. It is. And I yeah. think that, so those, Rosemary's Baby is a movie that I've watched 100 times, and I'll go back to 100 times. So the greats still hold up for me. Um, you know what's crazy, and I'm, I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to say the names of the movies, but there's movies that I remember that, that still today are revered as classics that people always mention that I watch and I laugh at. They're, they're, they're ridiculous to me. Um, but then there are other films like, like the ones I just mentioned that, again, I can watch Rosemary's Baby a hundred times and still be creeped out by it. Uh, I, I'm going to overlap with The Shining. I remember I watched it, and I was, <clears throat> I don't know, probably 12 or 13 or something, and watched it in the middle of the night, and I could not sleep the entire night because something in our in the back half of the house had fallen, but I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and it was a picture frame in the morning. I saw it was a picture frame had fallen piece by piece onto the ground, but I stayed up the entire night. 
Um, and then I saw aliens in the theater when I was like eight or nine, and I just sat there like this, pinned. My mom was like, we can leave, we can leave. And I was like, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, and then uh, I, don't know, I remember, I don't know where I was, but I was, I was pretty young, and Nightmare on Elm Street was playing, and the older kids were all watching that, and I snuck up, and I <clears throat> was behind the couch because I wasn't allowed to be in there watching Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street really did freak me out as a kid because you could sleep, like if you knew that it wasn't real, you could go to sleep and it would be gone and you would be okay, but Freddy gets you in your sleep, <laughs> so you're not safe. That's the one place. That's why I think that that was so genius, is like my whole get, get out of the, you know, I was, I was afraid of vampires too. I, I still, my wife makes fun of me. Whenever I'm scared, I cover up my neck. But I would sleep, totally covered up like this, but then he gets you in your so sleep. Cute. And I did. I had dreams that he came and got me. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, for me, um, what's funny, he brought up Henry Porcher, serial killer. My, my brother-in-law is Mike Rooker, yeah. and we uh, kind of grew up together for, you know, when I was younger. So watching that, it was terrifying, but then again, it was kind of, eh, it's, you know, it's Mike, you know, and, and so it was hard for me to, to uh, relate to that. But um, Exorcist for me was one that was, um, that to this very day is... Uh, uh, too scary. I mean, very scary and very impacting. I remember I have memories of my father when we, when I was young, taking me to uh, Doctor Fibes, you know, Vincent Price movie. That was one for me. That it was comical now that I watch it, but at the time it was it was scary and very cool. And and he has no and, skull. Or yeah. he has, he's all skull. And I love I love love love, the, you know, the original Frankenstein, the original Dracula. Those. And I, I think they scared me when I was younger, now they don't, but I think they just have, they just bring such great memories of being introduced to the monster side of things. Yeah. Do you know what, aliens, of course, for sure. Do you know what's crazy about watching movies again is I think that movies change as you get older, obviously. So a movie that was terrifying for you when you were eight years old, when you watch as you're 18 years old, it becomes laughable. Not that that movie is any worse than it was then. The fact is, is that as you get older and your experiences change and what you've been exposed to change, so, you know, it, it's hard for me to go back and rewatch some of those movies that I'm sure were great when I saw them. But, but to me, I guess my life experiences have changed them to not be scary. But um, I, I forgot what I was going to say. Never mind. Forget that. Yeah. One, more, one, one more for me that is very impactful that um, is, was scary, but I, I watch over and over. It's a Jason and the Argonauts, just the whole that whole style, that claymation thing, yeah. I guess, is that what it's called? Stop motion, stop motion. Stop motion, stop motion yeah. Just Harry, to me, Harry has to it. this yeah. mi you know, second, it's just, oh my gosh, that's so movie? cool. Jason and the Argonauts. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. All kind of creatures. Just that whole, yeah, the creatures, the, the, the skeletons when they came up with, from the yeah. teeth. Ah, <laughs> Exorcist. <That's> so awesome. <laughs> Exorcist so still is scary to me. Yeah. Every time I see the Exorcist, I still yeah. get Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exorcist is killer. My son just watched it. He's 24, and he just watched it. And I was interested to see what his opinion was. If it, yeah, and because he had never seen it before, and he loves movies, and he he just raves. And he and so I guess, you know, it's not dated is my point because it's got a great, great, you know, story great stuff going and, on and great, uh, well done, you know, shot. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions from the room uh, over here. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Alex. I'm in the game design master's program. Um, this, this is particularly for Darren, but it goes for everyone. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, Darren, in the documentary Nightmares in Red, White, and Blue, you talked about Henry Porter, a serial killer, Last House on the Left, and John Doe from Seven, and you mentioned, and you mentioned how they were kind of more, more hum, human, and how compared right. to Jason, John Doe was a, kind of a scrawny guy. Yeah. Uh, I was one. I was wondering, do you do you guys think that uh, that a villain, particularly in a horror movie, is a lot more interesting when he tends to be be more human or doesn't see himself as a villain? Because John Doe, you absolutely, know, John Doe sees himself as like right righteous or serving God and Jigsaw, which you directed, thinks, you know, he's actually like a social justice act, that yeah. kind of stuff. 
Yeah. It's much easier for me to be terrified by a real person than a monster. And again, I think that John Kramer had flaws. Jigsaw had flaws. He was dying of cancer. He was sickly. And then to watch, oh, I'm going to go back to Last House on the Left for a second. Why I always go back to that one movie? There's one moment in the original film, one, one second, and it's a hard one to miss. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an easy one to miss, but it's a hard one to forget. The killers, if those have seen Last House on the Left, Krug and his band of, of misfits, they, they um, rape a woman, and then they, stay, they cut her, their name in her, in her chest. And there's a moment as the girl is crying and, and moving away from them that they all look down at their hands and their hands are bloody and they have grass in them and they look disgusted and they all, there's a momentary thing of regret and you can see it in their faces where they're picking the grass out and they realize what they've just done. And that one moment disturbed me more than any moment in history because these killers feel remorse and then they say, and then they turn. You only see it for a second, but it's there. And I think that to me, um, people that... Uh, like Jigsaw, you kind of understand why he's doing it. I don't agree with why he's doing it, but you get it. And I think that there are a lot of killers out there like that. I think it's easier for me to be terrified of somebody that I see myself in than someone I could never see myself becoming. Um, not that I'm going to kidnap people and put them in needle pits. Um, not anymore, at least. Um, <laughs> but He's got I, a I son think, now. So. Yeah, it's easier no for time. me to be scared of that guy than it is a guy to wear a hockey mask. Now, I love, I love the Friday the 13th movies. Those are some of my favorite films growing up as a kid. But to, to, to think that it's a kid who drowned in, a, in, a, in the lake, who then became deformed, all this stuff, I have a harder time, the suspension of disbelief, than I do about a guy named John Doe, who's just upset and who's angry at the world. Because there's a lot of people out there that are upset and angry with the world. And I think to me, it's, that's, a, that's a scarier thing and a more realistic thing to believe in. So those, to me, are the scarier characters. I also like people that are, that are not your typical villains. Um, my new movie, Abattoir, the, the villain is an 80-year-old man. And it's, he's a bad, one of the greatest villains in cinema history that I... It, it, go watch the movie Seconds, John Frankenheimer's Seconds. There is an old man who runs a company called Seconds, and he's like Orville Redenbacher. Literally, imagine Colonel Sanders by way of Orville, Orville Redenbacher. And this is the villain. And he is the sweetest, kindest old man, but he'll stab you. He'll kill you. <laughs> and uh, it's, those are the type of killers that I'm much more fascinated with and villains that I'm more fascinated with. Uh, okay. Uh, oh. Next question. Okay, well, you I have... a Zytrate Anatomy shirt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All yeah, right. So, <laughs> it was a shirt my mom got me for my birthday, so yeah. Nice. Um, my name is Savvy. I'm in the film program. I'm a big fan of your movies, Darren, and I, not, not really a question, but I just want to say Repo was the movie that actually inspired me to continue writing hard because I, it was something I got teased for in middle school all the time because I always wanted to write horror and suspense and like, stuff that's thrilling, and... I always got made fun of for it, and then I saw I, I, I saw Repo behind my mom's back because she wouldn't let me watch movies like that. But I watched it, <laughs> and it was so it was something that was so original and so different. And I personally wanted to tell you that it was something that really inspired me to keep going with writing horror and suspense. So I really have you to thank for that. So well, thank come here first off. Come here. That's your awesome. <laughs> Um, you know, I was, I was not good at school. I was, I was bad. I was bad at, at all of, almost every class. I was not athletic. Um, I was, I was not really in any kind of scene. The only thing that I, I guess got me out of my high school career, my middle school thing was Rocky Horror Picture Show. And, um, I, I think I remember going through high school and even in college, I was, I, 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 didn't fit into any, any kind of program. And that wasn't cool. But what was cool is when you walk in into a theater and you find yourself embraced by everyone and basically saying, it's okay to be weird. It's okay to be different. It's okay to dress in tights if you're a dude. It's okay if you want to wear two tight t-shirts if you're a little overweight. I like that because to me, um, there's so many posers out there, people that are trying to do what they think is cool. LA is filled with them. I'm going to go to a place, I'm going to pay $25 for a beer, and I'm going to drive a car I can't afford, and I want to do whatever. That's all bullshit. What to me is cool is movies like Rocky Horror Picture Show, movies that embrace being different, being unique, being artistic. And I should be inspiration to anyone out there. I didn't have any connections in Hollywood. I didn't know anyone in Hollywood. I came to Florida not knowing anyone. 
but everything is what you make of it. So when I got to Full Sail, I said, screw this, I wanna go make my version of Rocky Horror Picture Show. It took me a few years to do it, but I did it, and that became Repo. And I think you guys can do whatever the fuck it is you want to do. If you put your mind to it, you believe in yourself, and you use the resources you have at this school. Anyone that tells you you can't do it is scared that you will. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, uh, but I do want to thank everyone for being here today, uh, for attending this session, uh, and I really want to thank uh, our guests for being with us, Darren, Hunter, and Jay, for their knowledge, their passion, and their valuable information. Let's give them a hand. I just want to let everyone know if you, I have a movie coming out next month called Fearful Fettuccine. Um, <laughs> you guys can see it at the local multiplex.
Um, hi, everyone. Again, uh, thanks for joining us online. Uh, we have a few pre-selected questions for our guests uh, from our online audience. Um, gentlemen, these uh, are going to pertain to the international horror industry and your uh, perspective on it, your opinions about it. Um, Ivan asks, do you think the U.S. is the leader in horror films with things like Shudder uh, first being made outside of this country? Do I think we're the leader, but with shut? No, I mean, I love international horror films. I mean, Japan, J horror. I mean, that's that's terrifying. I think there's some really, really interesting stuff coming out of Europe too. And I think that probably one of the most disturbing films I've seen in the last few years. And I don't recommend anyone go watch it because it's gonna. It's a really depressing. Is uh, a Serbian film. Do which, not go see that. Do not go no. see it. But it's it's. I, I, think, I think you get on a watch list if you buy it, right? I, yeah, I probably. I'm already on a watch list. But uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, listen. I think I think every culture has their own thing that terrifies them and scares them. And I think it's interesting. And I think it's our duty to watch other stuff so we can. Again, you you talked uh, earlier about. Um, is it important to watch other films? For me, it's really important because, you know, I'm not going to lie. I, I handpick. I see something out of J-horror I like. I see something out of European film I like, and you try to Americanize it. It's unique voices everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and along those same lines, ATA asks, what do you think about Spanish horror films, including Pan's Labyrinth and The Orphanage uh, and others? Uh, Guillermo del Toro is my hero. Yeah. So, I mean, he's... He's beautiful. And I think he's a he's a leader in doing things that I love. They're kind of adult fairy tales. Uh -huh. They're uh, they're beautiful and they they harken back to like Alice in Wonderland, but a dark, menacing, horrific version of them. Pan's Labyrinth was probably the most beautiful, sh beautifully shot film, and it was horrific at the same oh, time. I when I saw that, I, was, I couldn't believe it. It was it was a fantastic experience. Uh, you guys looking forward to uh, Crimson Peak? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Trailer looks good. Specifically now, I mean, everyone's talking about it. Stephen King and Joe Hill and everyone else is just raving about it. It looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, guys, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and thank you online. Uh, we look forward to having you at our next Full Sail on-air session. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.